Welcome everyone to Educate's Virtual Road Trip, trip 2020. I'm Pam Brandon and I want to, you to all know that we are delighted that you have joined us today as we kick off the new year of learning and growing together in the culture change journey. The response has been amazing, so thank you for being a part of today's webinar. Our mission on this road trip is to bring innovators and creative minds together to learn about how others are moving forward on person-centered care initiatives, sharing what culture change really means and how we can all address and respond to the needs of our fast aging world. Our road trip will take us across the US and abroad gaining new perspectives for all of us. We'll be meeting new people and we'll all be igniting change together. Before I introduce Joan, I'll just remind everyone that participant audio is turned off during the webinar, but Joan has an interactive presentation. So we hope you will join the chat when you're prompted. I'm so pleased to introduce our good friend, Joan Devine. Joan serves as the Director of Education for Pioneer Network, who are also our great friends and partners. She is the owner and operator of JP Divine Consulting, whose mission is to support care partners on their journey to home. Joan is a registered nurse and former activity professional with 30 years of experience in healthcare. Uh, having served in leadership positions in both long-term care and acute care settings. Joan is a passionate advocate for person-centered care. I heard her presentation on person-centered care language at, at Pioneer Networks, amazing. You're in Louisville, Kentucky, and knew at that point that um, at some point I wanted her to join us so we could share what she shared at the conference with our network. So it worked out perfectly when she did the, uh, the webinar today, we are kickoff for 2020. One interesting Joan, um, in addition to a in nursing and master's in management, she also holds a BA in music education and music therapy. Needless to say, Joan is a woman of many talents. So grab your road snacks, buckle your seat belts, and let's take off. Our first stop is St. Louis. So welcome, Joan, and I'm now going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you so very much, Pam. It is just an absolute delight to be here. So if you'll all bear with me a second, we're gonna see how well this technology works, and I'm going to share um, my PowerPoint with you. Um, we'll see how well that works. Give me just one second. Play it from the start and see what happens. And hopefully right now you're all seeing my PowerPoint. So, uh, so we're ready to start. So th th this session, this uh, talk, um, Truly, I would like to be interactive. I'd like it to be a conversation. And as it says, they're discovering the power of words, um, the language of, of a new culture of aging. Uh, I truly believe, as do so many that are uh, engaged in this journey to change the culture of aging, care, and support, that the words we use, the language we use, really does influence so much of what we do and who we are. So what the people before your care is to know the person. Um, and so I'd like to ask in the chat box, if you wouldn't mind, just briefly pop in there. Uh, who do we have here with us? What type of care settings um, are you from? And what type of roles uh, do you uh, hold within those care settings? So we know we have the, the, the team from Educate, and I do kind of know a little bit about what they do. Um, and as you've heard from Pam, uh, oh, Ben Soma. Well, hi, Ben. I even know you. Um, <laughs> ben, is, ben is with a memory care. Um, let's see, we have uh, Corey with a community setting dementia care specialist, Holly, uh, uh, licensed social worker, very nice, with Alzheimer's Association, someone from uh, the, an area on uh, agency on aging. Wow, these are popping fast. 
Lots of, wow, great people. Hospice and bereavement support, what a wonderful role, and thank you for the work that you do there. An activity director, yay, let's do it for our life enrichment professionals. At our end, there was another one of my passions, right at home, so we have some home health um, folks. So we have a variety of uh, people. Uh, Mary from a disability services, if I'm saying this wrong, I apologize, I'm trying to read fast. Talent management specialists, we need lots of talent. Um, in, in this organization and dining. How wonderful um, to have someone from dining. So it's good to see a diverse group of people um, and, and you'll see a, a wide variety of ideas and thoughts as, we, uh, as, as I share what uh, I'm gonna share with you in the next hour. So words and your world, you know. Um, so starting out with, here's another question for you. How do you like to be addressed? What do you like people to call you? Um, how do you like them to call you? And you have any preferences on that? Do, do most people you think have a preference as to what you want to be called? Um, I'll tell you one of my biggest is I really like being called Joan instead of Joanne because that's just not my name. Um, <laughs> that, that, um, so, so that's very important to me. Um, some people, you know, we know particularly some of the, uh, some elders, uh, they like to be called by Mr. or Mrs. That that's a sign of respect for them. And you know, I don't know about you, but actually, I have to change my bio because it's Pam said 30 years in healthcare, and I'm pushing 40. So, <laughs> been around for a while. And I grew up in the age uh, and in the days where using that surname was very much a sign of respect and something that people expected and and felt when they earned, that they earned that. So, a very important piece in terms of you know what. Uh, what you like to be addressed. But the other side of that coin is what do you not like to be addressed? Are there ways that people approach you sometimes that just really bothers you um, with the language that they use? Let's see if anybody has an answer to that one. Sometimes it's easier to think of the things that we really don't like. Oh, there we go. Candy or honey or sweetie. Absolutely. Uh, waitresses have, God love them, but waitresses have a way of doing that to us a lot. And yet how often have we done that, used that terminology in our, in our care communities, particularly in nursing homes, that, we, that there's a feeling that it's okay because someone is old that I can call you honey or sweetie. Um, and you know, maybe somebody likes that, um, but did I ask? if that was okay. And, you know, even asking, sometimes people are going to say yes. Oh, there you go, Ben, instead of Benjamin. Well, thank you, Benjamin. That is good for me to know. So I will do my best. Um, sir, does that make you feel, you don't like being called sir. I see you want, oh, too formal. I got it. Because you're kind of an informal kind of person. Good to know. Um, and we have a William who doesn't like to be called Bill. So I think those things are very important. And sometimes we don't ask either our caregivers um, or our residents or the, the elders that we work with, just exactly what they would like to be called. And a name is a very personal thing and a part of language that really kind of sets the tone uh, for so much. Ah, January and not Jan. That's a beautiful name, January. I like it. Very pretty. Yeah, I think we, we have a way of becoming familiar. And I think that's especially true in our community settings is somehow we have that ability to be familiar. Sometimes we're very unfamiliar and we use last names and I would call you Brown. Um, that, that doesn't seem right either. And yet how many times I can tell you, I've sat in a Medicare meeting where people have talked about Jones and Smith and, and whomever, and it seems very impersonal um, to call someone you know, in that way. So. Question is, do we have a problem? Is, is this whole issue with language really a problem? Well, quite a number of years ago, Karen Shaneman, who was with the with CMS, the Center for Medicare, um, wrote a paper called May Day, and there's a reference to that in the, in, in the slide, so you will see that later. But what she said was, yes, that over time, I've come to realize that much of the language we use is in need of replacement because it unintentionally demeans people, contributing to a hierarchical sense of us and them, or dehumanizing institutional culture instead of a nurturing community with respect for its members. And I think some key things that she says in here that I always like to share um, when I talk about language with people or the things that we do on this person-centered or culture change journey is that we're good people. And the things we've done, including the language we use, 
has not been because we don't care, hasn't because we're, we're cruel or, or malicious in any way. It's been unintentional. We have been, it's been a part of the culture that we lived in at the time. It's been a part of the norms. It's a part of that medical model that as we all know, was kind of what formed so much of what we all do and which we are so, uh, so passionately trying to undo and we all know how challenging undoing can be. So I think it's always important to remind people that first off, we're gonna slip and we're gonna fall back and we're gonna use a word that you know maybe we shouldn't, shouldn't use that there's a better, a better opportunity. Those things are going to happen because we're human, um, but we're doing the best we can. And the best we can do is to, to find better ways. And I think another thing in Karen's definition that's really important is that, you know, the fact that it was based on that hierarchy, that us and them. And that's where a lot of that structure came from. As we break down that structure, hopefully we will also change the language. And conversely, as we change the language, our hope is that that will help us to break down that structure. So what is the language of culture change? Language that acknowledges and respects long-term care residents, or I could exchange that to elders or individuals or people, I could use the word people, as individuals. And maybe people's the best word to put in there. Um, I, had, I have to tell you, I learned something new every time I do this presentation, and this one just hit me as an aha. That's probably not a good definition. That it really respects all of us as individuals, whether we are uh, staff or residents or family members or whoever we are, in the culture that we are trying to create, being person-centered, being individualized, is absolutely a core um, element in all of that. So let's see what else we have here. Let's talk about people first. So fundamentally, uh, many of us have heard this phrase, it's all about relationships. So it is about being person-centered. It is knowing who the person is. So let me ask you a quick question again. What do you call the people who live and or work or are a part of uh, that you provide services to within your setting or within your service area? Residents. Preferred name or residents. It's always good to call people by their name. Folks, clients, persons living with dementia, older adults, members, I've heard that one, uh, elders, consumer, Client, constituents, elders, there you go, by their preferred name, I love that. I mean, really, when it comes right down to it, there's the answer, don't generalize, it's individual. Um, ladies and gentlemen, how very nice, I like that. Uh, neighbors in our community, wow, we've got a great group of people on this call who have uh, really embraced so much of this. Thank you, this is kind of fun. So let me talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the ways we talk about people. Friends, oh, I like that, thank you, Julie. Um, so I'm, I'm going to start out with, with a term that is, can be a little bit controversial at times, and we're going to talk about an elder. Uh, I saw a couple people did use elder, and um, I happen to be, one of the things that was not in, uh, mentioned in my bio is I also happen to be uh, an Eden educator and mentor, and uh, with the Eden alternative, one of the terms that is very widely used is elder. And I have to tell you, I will confess to you that I was one of those people when I first heard it used, the kind of, ah, I don't like that term, that just sounds old and it sounds, you know, all those, yeah, it just didn't come across good to me. And then I explored it a little bit more. And, and here's what I challenge people to do when you think of the term. And I'm not saying to anybody, it's the term you have to use because it's a lot. I like the term as I've explored a little bit more just what it is. So when you think of an elder, tell me what you think of. What does that bring to mind? Old, wisdom. Wisdom, there we go. We got a couple of wisdoms there. Experience, Lord of the Rings, there we go. I was in uh, Austra uh, New Zealand not too long ago and saw all of that. Respect, integrity, wisdom. You know, the, the most powerful people in the village, there you go. Anyone older than me and respect, I like that. And oh my gosh, these are great. And where we see elders, 
oftentimes is the elder in our church, the elder in a tribal community. So they are very respected people. Now, I think the challenge that I personally faced with the term elder, and I think so many other do, come from the addition of two little letters, and that is L-Y. So now, when I think of the term elderly, what are some of the adjectives, what are some of the things you would think of to describe the word elderly? There we go, sick and frail, disabled, aged, frail, weak, uh, frail. So I don't want to be considered elderly, but being an elder is kind of cool. So I think that's where so much of this has come, that that little nuance makes a huge difference. Um, I have to tell you here in the state of Missouri, and I hate to admit this in my own state, uh, we have a national, we have an annual conference put on by uh, our medical directors, and it's called the Frail Elder, Elderly Conference. And I cringe every time I've sent them a letter, but you know, you can only do what you can do. Um, <laughs> But anyway, so here's, here's elders. Now, this, this definition of an elder was written um, over 30 years ago by a group of elders themselves from the Live Oak Project. And if you've not seen this before, it is just such a cool definition. Uh, so I, I'm going to go ahead and read it. An elder is a person who is still growing, still a learner, still filled with potential, and whose life continues to have within it promise for and connection to the future. An elder is still in pursuit of happiness, joy, and pleasure, and their birthright to these remains intact. Moreover, an elder is a person who deserves respect and honor and whose work it is to synthesize wisdom from long life experience and formulate this into a legacy for future generations. I don't know about you, but I would love to be one of those people, um, and I'm getting there. Um, <laughs> So I, I think it's, it's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of how we think about um, what it means to be an elder. Uh, but again, it's a term some people like and some people don't, and, and that's okay. Now, here's another term that, um, term that I want to share a little bit, a kind of, as a, and this also is something that we're seeing more and more of, and that's the term care partner. Um, and this term is being used a lot um, in, in, contrast to caregiver or care receiver with as you see here in the definition it's saying that a care partner is really all of us every one of us has a role as a care partner and part of this comes from the belief that it is about being every one of us no matter what our situation in life is is both a giver and a receiver so we're partners in care we're partners in life it's not all about it's not a one-sided relationship and you know things i happen to have the the, the privilege um and certainly the challenges of being a family caregiver um not too long ago for both my sister and my mother and um it certainly puts a new light on it and being a partner with them uh seeing myself as a partner to them and not just um, a caregiver to them, for one thing, gave me a continued role as a family member, made me feel that I still had a place, uh, a very uh, needed place in this relationship. But it also reminded me that it is a partnership, that it is about them. Um, and it is my goal to, to partner with them and not, you know, be the person that kind of holds the, holds the strings and tells them uh, what to do or where to go. Um, so let me look at the let's look at the next thing. So this is just some, some just some words that kind of fit in there um, with people and and some word that we use that maybe some are good, some are bad. Frontline staff. I have to tell you, we use that a lot. And here's my perception of frontline staff. All I can think of is that World War One movie that I saw in high school, where everybody comes out with the bayonets and they're charging and they're going into battle. And if I come out alive, then you can come and follow me. Well. <laughs> You know, what an interesting perception that is, an image that is of what life might be like um, as we care for our elders. And it's a kind of a sad image, if you ask me. It's not a battle. So, you know, to the front line, I, I'm not sure that's a good word. Uh, room 123, we've seen that a lot. Uh, demented, um, that's a very sad uh, word, I think, to use. 
uh, for people. And then looking at, you know, departments versus, um, you know, trying to break down those silos and see us more as one organization, as one community, as one family um, is, is certainly something to look at. Diabetic. Now, I have that on there just as an example of oftentimes, again, in that traditional medical model, we refer to people by their illness. Um, and, you know, I, Pam, in my, her bio of me or anything that I have said, I didn't come out and say, hi, I'm Joan, I have hypertension and I'm a fall risk. Now, the truth of the matter is, those are probably, those are both true. Um, but that's not who I am. And that's not how I want people to build a relationship with me based on. Um, so, and yet we do that um, a lot. Here's another word that this is, this is one that just, I think a lot of people will say this one makes them cringe, and that is the word feeder. Um, I, I don't know how many of you remember the days um, in long-term care when we had those lovely horseshoe-shaped tables that we would, as a care provider, sit in the middle of and just make the rounds as we shoveled food, literally, um, to make sure people got fed. And how sad is that? And here's the other piece about that word that is, is an interesting piece. Uh, the resident was never the feeder anyway. Uh, we were the feeder, if anything, they were the feedee. But why isn't it just someone that we're helping to assist with eating? I think that's one of the challenges that we have and we've had in this medical model is the desire to be able to kind of label something, to put a quick term to it. And I don't know whether that's, uh, well, there you go. No one would ever call their baby a feeder. Uh, you got it, Candace. Um, but I think sometimes we wanted to have that one quick word so that I can say it quickly, so that I can write it quickly. But really, you know, it's about helping someone to eat. There's no reason why I need to have a special word to tell me that. It can just be the experience that I have. Now, here's an interesting, whoops, well, I went the wrong way, I think. Here's, here's an interesting something that I want to share with you. Um, see this picture right here of this lovely gentleman. Tell me what it is that he is wearing. Oh, what is room 123? Julie, that's just, in my experience, oftentimes we call people by their room numbers. Um, instead of being Mrs. Smith, it's 123. Okay, so we have clothing protector, we have bib, uh, a lot of clothing protectors. Um, I've heard the term extra large dinner napkin. I'm not sure how that one quite fits there, but I've heard it. Um, so yeah, lots of different terms we have for it. Um, a clothing protector, but it is really a bib. There you go, Candace, you got this. No matter what you're calling, it's a demeaning bib. And I think that's exactly the point uh, that I would like to make. Is it the word or the practice? I think sometimes in our efforts, we get a little bit overzealous and feel like if I change the language, if I change the word, then it makes it okay. But it doesn't. Um, it, it's still, it, it, it's not necessarily, the, the word itself, sometimes it's not a matter of replacing, it's a matter of eliminating. Now, I will tell you, I always caution when I, I do webinars and talk about the bibs. The good news is, oh, there we go, we use aprons. And I've seen that done beautifully uh, with people. So some people still want something. You know, the question is why? Is it because they're afraid we won't um, help them uh, to get cleaned up? Uh, afterwards. Uh, I think it's a lot of peer pressure because when you see everyone else has one, then all of a sudden it becomes, I guess, I'm supposed to do this too. Um, we have a lot more compliance now, I think, than we will have in the future when the boomers get in there because we're not going to be quite as quick to say, I'm going to go along. So really, it, it's something we need to think about when we're looking at what we're changing. Sometimes it's a matter of, of eliminating um, and not just changing something. And I think uh, lots of, you know, that comes into things like the things that we say that promote ageism, like I'm having a senior moment. You know, I don't know about you, but my young grandkids and my children forget things too. Um, and it's not labeled as, as a factor of their age. It may be labeled as a factor of they're busy, that they're multitasking, that you know, life has gotten crazy and we're all trying to deal with too much information um, at one time. Uh, it's not necessarily because of my age. Um, so I think we have to look at those things and what we're saying. And sometimes we just need to change um, the word that we have. I'm going to move on to the next thing, and that is the environment. So in a traditional nursing home, in a traditional care setting, what have we, what have we called it?
Well, let me ask you this question. Does anybody know what the F word is in culture change? And please don't go, keep it clean, because I'm not going there, so don't you go there either. Do you know what the F word is in culture change? Facility, it's facility, absolutely. When I think of facility, that's what I think of. My husband works in manufacturing and he works in facilities. So what kind of things describe a facility? What kind of things do you see in an environment that is a facility? Well, we try to use the word community and neighborhood, absolutely. You see a sameness, yeah, in a factory, I want, I want things kind of regimented. I see long hauls, cold and sterile, uh, a lot of employees, just people doing their jobs. Uh, yes, a very clinical uh, concept within a facility. Um, nursing units, stations, beige everywhere, there you go. Just really exciting environment. Uh, very industrial, I want, uh, uh, yeah, not inviting a home. These are great feedback and I, and I, Mom calls it the home. Oh, and she lives there. We say you mean your home. Oh, that's cool, Beth. I like that. So yeah, and when we think of facility, uh, we think of, you know, fairly cold, regimented. And when I look back to my early days in long-term care, you know what? They were facilities because we did have the long line for the bath. We had the long line to go into the dining room. Everything was very regimented in terms of what we did and how we did it. So unfortunately, we we lived up to the word facility, but we want to change that. The word we want to live up to these days is home. So when you think of home, what are the words that you'd use to describe home? Comfort, warmth, welcoming, mind, safe, personalized, yeah, family, mind. Great words, personal beauty, memories, warm, calming, colorful, relaxing, secure, safe. You know, the, the wonderful thing, when you ask this question to your, oh, peace, that's a great one, Lisa. When you ask your, this question to your team, and I, I love to explore language in this way by having people think it through so we understand the why and not just the what. Um, when you ask people to describe home, rarely, rarely is your response a building or a structure. It is a feeling. And that's what home is. And I think the beauty to that is it reminds us, here you go, not the home, just home. <laughs> it reminds us that um, home can be created anywhere. You know, for that person who says, but we don't have the money to change the environment itself. But you do have the ability to create that feeling of home, that sense of home uh, for the people that live there. So, you know, you, you can really make a difference. And within that home, think about the language that you use. Uh, do you have living rooms? Do you have dining rooms? Or do you have units and divisions and wards? Um, so within the context, we can make it, um, we can create the spaces that are the spaces that mean home to us. But it doesn't mean, again, just changing the name of a room and calling it the living room tomorrow instead of uh, the lobby or the day room. It, you have to also look at how it's furnished and how it's used and, and what happens there. Uh, because as we just said, home is about feelings and emotions and, and, and it's very personal uh, to people. I share that when my husband moves, if he ever uh, comes to live in a long-term care community, you're going to have a real challenge because to make it feel like home to him, um, he has to have a genuine lazy boy, not a cheap imitation, um, and it has to be facing the TV, the window, and the doorway that people come in because he needs to be able to see all of that um, from his vantage point on his lazy boy. Um, so it, what creates that sense of home is so very personal to people and how do we make, how do we bring that personal uh, to them? So we talked a little bit about home and now let's talk a little bit about the things that we do within that home and the language that we use to describe and then I'll, and then if you have others, please feel free to pop in. So here's a couple. Discharge. How many when you, how many of you when you moved out of your house were discharged from your house? Um, the term eloped. 
Uh, there's a, I find that an interesting one. You know, it, it, it connotates that I'm escaping from something. Well, if I'm escaping from something, that also meant I was held captive someplace. Uh, and that's certainly not the way I want to feel about my life. Same thing we talked about discharge, the same thing's true with admit. I wasn't admitted to my home. I moved in to my home. You know, one of the phrases that just uh, kind of makes me cringe is when someone says, I'm putting mom in the nursing home. You're not putting mom in the nursing home, or you shouldn't be, or you shouldn't feel that way. You're finding a new home for your mom, a different home. We've all lived in many, many different homes in our lives. And some of them were, you know, some of them were nicer than others. You know, we've lived in dorm rooms, uh, but, but we found a way to make it home. Uh, and that's what we're, we're wanting to do. Uh, other terms like uh, toilet, that is an interesting toilet. Okay, look up toilet in the dictionary because the way we use it is we say, I'm going to go toilet Mrs. Smith. Toilet is a noun, not a verb. And I don't know when we turned it into a verb, but it's kind of cold. I don't say I'm gonna go toilet my kids. I say I'm going to take my grandson to the bathroom. Um, so yeah, it's a few more words to say, but how much more compassionate, how much nicer uh, that is. Uh, loading the bus, we're gonna load the bus with the residents. How about if we just help them uh, get onto the bus? Or we're going to tour. Uh, the facility, you know, why don't we take people around and show them around our homes? Um, we don't tour people through our homes, uh, for the most part, at least, unless we're on the house of tours, uh, for some reason. Shipping out, uh, I find that one interesting. I don't want to be shipped out. Uh, you know, a med pass, how about, you know, again, a, we're, we're providing your medications to you. Uh, and here's another one I find really fascinating is the word ambulate. Very medical word. So when I'm done with this webinar, uh, I'm not thinking that I'm gonna go downstairs and get my dog Cece and go ambulate her. Um, I think Cece and I may go for a walk, but uh, a very different context and it medicalizes what it is we're doing. Another one of those terms that I think we need to be very careful of how we use it, and there are appropriate places for many, many of these terms, but one of them is therapy. Um, just because I move into a community setting doesn't mean that everything I do is a therapy. You know, as, a, as an activity professional, you know, we call it, we so, you know, so many things, it's activity therapy, or as a musician, it's music therapy. And there is music therapy. There is legitimate, appropriate music therapy. Absolutely no question. But sometimes it's just music. Whoops, I don't know if that's showing up on the screen or not, but I apologize if it did. Um, sometimes we just, uh, it's just for enjoyment. It is not, it doesn't have to be therapy. So what's another word or verbiage for ambulate? Take a walk. Um, I'm going to walk down the hall with you. Um, and we're going to go for a stroll. Um, I think just common language uh, is really, you know, what we can use. And it, and it normalizes. Uh, yeah, walk with. There you go, Candace. Very good. Not that I, that was great. Thank you so much. I told you I learned something every time I do this. Uh, but you're right. It's, it's not me to you. It's us together. We're going for a walk. Uh, would you like to go for a walk with me or, you know, can I accompany you on a walk? Um, so yes, uh, center it around the, the resident. Thank you so very much for that. So let's look here. Now here's my pet peeve word, expired. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> you know, it comes up often. What do you say when someone dies? And so many times that institutional word we use, there you go, passing, I like that one. Uh, the is, you know, someone expired. Well, to me, and maybe this is a personal pet peeve, but remember this if you ever uh, care for me at the end of my life. Uh, expired means that like a library book, you can go in, you can pay the fine and everything will be good and you can get me back again. Um, and if that's not the case, then don't say I expired. Uh, say I died, say I passed away. You can even say I kicked the bucket if you would like. I'm okay with that. Um, and, and it's, the, the challenge is this is a tough one because a lot of people, and we, I know we have some folks on from hospice services here, and you are incredible people uh, that work in that line. Thank you so much. Um, but often to all the, the residents that live in our nursing homes, oftentimes they're not the ones that are uh, afraid of the terminology or, or afraid of saying it. It's us. 
it's us. Uh, and so we don't even want to have the conversation. So when you want to know what the residents living in your community, what term they want to use uh, at the end of life when they die, the best way to find out is ask them. You know, and, and I think the worst thing we can do is avoid it. Uh, because, you know, as they say, there's two things in life that are inevitable and it's death and taxes. Um, so why not just acknowledge it, but be respectful um, of, of the individuals and explore and discover what they want, you know, how, what they want to be said. And then along with that, the any traditions or, or rituals that, that support um, that as well is so important. So let's move on to leadership. Leadership we know is, um, I mean, it truly is the fundamental, wise leadership is the fundamental. Uh, thing that we need to be sure that we have and that we embrace if we're going to move forward in changing the culture of aging, care, and support. Um, and so thinking about how, what, who we are as leaders and the kind of terminologies and the kind of processes that, that those uh, uh, imply uh, as we work on, it's in long-term care, we have traditionally been a very hierarchical uh, have a very hierarchical model of how we provided care and services. And I think there was much more management than leadership. And that's truly what we emphasize. The other challenge to leadership in our field is that oftentimes we don't do it as good a job of preparing people to be that leader. Um, I know in my own experience, you know, if you were a good nurse, a good clinical nurse that made you a candidate for being promoted uh, up the chain. And that being a good clinical nurse and being a good leader are not necessarily one in the same thing. Fortunately, many times they are, but not always. Um, I have to tell you, I just looked up and I saw, I, Marcy, if I'm saying that correctly, uh, this comment, I'll race you to the door. That's a good way to get a walk going. I like that. I apologize. I have a little bit of attention issue here. So let me go back to leadership. Um, so leadership, a couple things to think about, you know, in the, in the language that we use, uh, do we have to use the word discipline so much? Um, and do we have to use the practice of discipline so much? Could we do more with coaching? Could we do more with counseling? Uh, could we do more with conversations uh, instead of this, this kind of uh, negative approach, which is kind of that discipline uh, model, which discipline and counseling gets written all over our, our policies and procedures. Instead, can we change some of that language? So what people are reading is that they're going to be approached more from a, a, a coaching and a counseling perspective than everything, the answer to everything that goes wrong is discipline. So looking at the language that's in our policies and procedures in our handbooks that are describing those things, um, thinking about the whole issue of control, um, and, you know, is it really ours? Do, do we need to control everything? Um, or do we want to do a better job of empowering and bringing other people uh, on board and, and helping them to learn and grow? And, and empowering doesn't mean I throw it out to you and tomorrow, tomorrow it's yours to do. Like anything else, and what makes this whole journey so challenging is empowering is a process. And empowering means giving people the tools, the education, uh, the framework, uh, the, the ways to, to work so that they can be successful in what it is that we're asking them to do. Um, and we're not always, we don't always take the time to do all that to make it work. Uh, and other comments as, as things, you know, you all talked, you talked in the beginning about uh, what you call people. And I think, you know, thinking in terms of subordinates or thinking that you work for me versus I work with you, very simple words, but they really do send a very strong message. Uh, and it takes time because uh, for a lot of our staff, they are very used to that hierarchy and they're very used to somebody else making the decision and somebody else, quite frankly, you being able to pass the buck too. But what we're saying is we all need to be accountable, but we need to change not only our language, obviously, as a piece of that, but then the practices that, that, that are a part of that new language that we're using. One of my favorite words uh, from the things we do in a leadership, I learned this from a uh, director of nursing I was working with a number of years ago, and it was looking at the word react versus respond. And we tend to be, as, and I'm generalizing, so I apologize for that, but we tend to be within, within the traditional uh, framework, we tend to be fairly reactionary. Um, 
and and her challenge was, you know, don't be so reactionary. And, and what happened was I was talking with her one day and she was telling me about a, a staff member who another manager had caught sitting on a resident's bed, just obviously, uh, you know, not doing her job because there she was when she should have been working and getting her task list done. She was talking to someone, heaven forbid. And my response to this DON was instead of, you know, jumping on that bandwagon, I just said, well, tell me a little bit more about what she was doing. What were they talking about? You know, you know, what was the, what was the resident needing? And her back to me was thank you for responding and not reacting to what I just shared with you or for what you might have seen had you encountered that situation. And then she shared a great way of really thinking about responding versus reacting. And you know, for those of us who are nurses, and even for those who aren't, just about every one of them, there you go, it's a task, it's about not about the task, it's about the person. But for those of us, every one of us has taken a medication at some point in our life. So tell me quickly, when you take a medication and you have a reaction to that medication, whatever the medication's for, you can just think it through, uh, what kind of things do you see when you react to a medication? Sickness, heat, side effects, rash, rash, yeah, lots of rashes. <laughs> There we go, oh, a whole bunch of rashes. Yep, we've all had those happen. So when I react to a medication, it's just not a good thing. Yeah, poor decision-making because I get, yeah, sometimes it may make me a little nervous or tense or uh, jumpy and, and all, yeah, not good things when I react to a medication. Now, if I respond to a medication, what kind of things might I see? Healing. Absolutely, I'm gonna feel better, I'm calmer, I'm a, I, it's positive. Yeah, my blood pressure went down because I took my blood pressure medication. My nausea went away because I took that uh, anti-nausea uh, medication. So the response is what I'm looking for. And I think that's a wonderful way to look at what is the difference between react and respond and it's something that uh, I think people within our, in our, our settings do understand. Um, and so it's a great, I share that and I, I you know, I, Barbara Frank and Kathy Brady, who are wonderful leaders in the person-centered care movement, uh, one of the things that they, they shared from the beginning was share shamelessly. So when you learn a good story, when you hear something good uh, that you think might help someone else, share it. So I, I'm sharing that with, uh, from a wonderful DON who shared it with me. Okay, let's look at thinking differently. So again, and this has come up in a few of your comments, so I appreciate that. So looking you know, at task orientation, stop thinking about tasks and think more about people. You know, the very first of the Pioneer Network principles, values and principles is know each person and that each person can and does make a difference. So thinking differently and thinking about the people instead of the things. Stop thinking of everything in terms of a problem you know, one of, the, one of the phrases that I think is interesting when we look at people is we, how many times have we heard about a family member before the resident, we even met the resident, and what we heard was this daughter's a complainer. And, and so what happens is we all label her before we ever see her as a complainer, and she's the one that we go hide behind a door when she comes in because we don't want it, we don't want to have to deal with it. Well, you know, maybe she just wanted mom to have a bath at a certain time. You know, maybe she's nervous. She's giving up her role um, and assuming a new role as her mother moves into your community or, or starts receiving care and services from you. Um, so, you know, by labeling her as a, as a complainer, uh, too oftentimes that sticks and it takes us a long time um, to get beyond that. So we have to think differently about that. Uh, thinking about things like, you know, taking credit and being right. Um, it's, it's not all about being right. It's not all about me. Uh, and that's, that's a different way of looking at leadership because we're looking at that team uh, versus individualized. The other thing that's, a, I think, a real challenge for us is the whole concept of black and white thinking versus shades of gray. Life isn't black and white. So how do we help people work through that gray? Um, and 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 that's, that's a tough one. And then the other one, another one is, is finding fault. Um, we're, you know, we have to find someone to blame. 
uh, for something versus looking at you know what we're doing and, and looking at it a different way. And here's one of my favorite, favorite words about thinking differently. And that is the word allow. It's a pretty powerful word when you think about it. <coughs> Excuse me. And here's my story about allow. The very first Pioneer Network conference that I ever attended was back in, I think, 2006 or seven, and it was in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And uh, I have to tell you, I was like, I always, the analogy I make is I was like a kid who went to Disney World for the first time and met Donald and Mickey and, and, and all their favorite uh, Disney characters. Well, here I was uh, in Minneapolis at a hotel and I'm meeting all these people whose books I had written, Bill Thomas and Steve Shields and, and uh, Barbara Frank and Kathy Brady and, and just uh, wonderful leaders within this movement. Uh, and I was just in awe. Well, at one point I was walking down the hall with a woman that I'll be honest, I didn't even really know who she was. Well, it turns out she was Rosemary Fagan, who is one of the founders of Pioneer Network and was at the time the <coughs> excuse me, executive director of Pioneer Network. And we're just walking down the hall, having a conversation. And in the midst of that conversation, Rosemary made a comment, something to the effect of, well, we allow the residents to do, and she stopped herself. And she just kind of looked and she said, allow, allow. She said, what am I doing using that word? It is not mine to allow someone else to do anything. These are adults. These are individuals who come with so much experience, who have the right to choice and autonomy and the dignity that we can provide to them. And it is not mine to allow them to do anything. Do I have to support? Can I be there to provide an environment um, that is right <clears throat> to grow you know, in the way that they would like to? Absolutely, but it's not, it's not something I have to give that they need my permission to get. And I have to tell you, most of us in this journey have had what we call an aha moment uh, where it just kind of sparked a new way of thinking. And that was probably the most profound aha moment I have had on my journey. And it really made me think about my relationship, not only with the residents and the elders that, that I have the privilege of serving uh, and being with and just knowing, but also with the people that I work with. So that was a pretty, that was, that one was a pretty big aha moment for me. And, and we don't have time today to explore it, but exploring aha moments is always a a fun way to think about how we have evolved um, and what has, has made a difference for us on this journey. So here's, a, here's another one that I just want to share quickly. And that is, you know, when we look at language, we oftentimes get caught up in our own world. Um, and we use that medical jargon versus plain talk. And it makes perfect sense to us but remember that this is not common language to so many people we work with. So we really need to look at our language and use common language um, with individuals and, and be very, very careful. Um, I had a, a good friend who was a, a med surge supplier uh, and had so new long-term care, worked with us all the time. And she said when her mom uh, was in a long-term care community and she went to that care plan meeting, she said she just truly felt so uncomfortable and like she didn't know what was going on. And it was because we just didn't create an environment um, that felt like home and, and, and was truly, uh, looking at who she was as a family member and certainly who the resident was and how do we communicate in a way um, that is meaningful for them. So definitely something for us to think about. And here's another term. <laughs> this is one of my, I learned this in one of these, when I did this presentation one time. And, and so I was asking the question, tell me about a word that is really problematic in your setting. And I had a, a young woman who worked at a VA community. So uh, contrary to what for most of us is common, the majority of their population obviously is male. Uh, and she said, here's the word that gets us in trouble all the time. And it's the word let's. Let's go take a bath. Let's go to bed. And so a young CNA, maybe kind of cute, uh, and she says that to uh, a gentleman who perhaps is living with dementia, 
uh, who perhaps is living at a time in his life where he was that Marine who was just uh, very macho. And I just had a good looking young girl invite me to go to bed with her. And he gets a little feisty. And we say he's sexually inappropriate. Really? Or was he just responding to the invitation that he heard? And, and, and so it was a real, that was a real aha. And a lot of us in the room kind of went, wow, hadn't thought about that. Because we don't, it's not us. It, it's, you know, it's like what we talked about with the walk. Someone mentioned that earlier. Um, it's, it's not let us do something. Um, I'm helping you to do something. So really um, looking at that, uh, at how we phrase things uh, is, can be a real eye opener uh, for all of us. And so here's another one that I, I think is a, a real interesting one for us to think of when we look at language that we use. And it's again, a very simple one and it's not unique to us, but just using the terms they and us. You know, our goal is not to create an us and them environment or mentality. Uh, we are trying desperately to break down silos. Um, it's not the nursing department versus the dining services department versus the activity department. The only way the resident truly gets all that they deserve is when we work together. And I don't own a piece of it and you own a piece of it. We all together uh, take responsibility for creating an environment for supporting a quality of life. Um, and, and that takes a different way of thinking. And I think, again, sometimes we have to be careful and watch ourselves. You know, am I using the term them a lot? Uh, am I referring to that other person outside of the context of the whole a lot? Am I singular, singularly thinking of my area or my discipline um, as something totally unique and, and in and of itself, or am I thinking of it as a part of the whole? And in my conversations, do I talk about it as a part of the whole? So I think that's a, a way that um, it's kind of a common language thing, but it's one we need to, to be thinking about and, and kind of have some checks and balances to watch ourselves for. Oh, we lost your audio, can you hear me now? Can, can someone pop me a note? Am I still not being heard? Okay, are you hearing me now? Okay, okay, I'm sorry about that. I love technology. Oh, <laughs> there we go. Okay, so let me go on to kind of, I think this is really my last word and I love this one. And it is, here's the other word that I think we just need to think about a little bit more. And that's the word no. Um, too many times we use the word no because it's the easiest answer because then I don't have to think about how to do something that might be a little bit challenging. And, and we live in the real world and I certainly appreciate that. So it's not that I can say yes to everything, whether it's what something my staff wants, whether it's something my family wants, whether it's something that a resident or an elder wants. Um, I can't always say yes to everything. But can I find a way to say yes? Can I find some part of what someone is looking for that I can say yes to? And this is a crazy example, but I'll use it because it's an easy one. You know, the resident who would like to go skydiving. I may not be able to help you go skydiving, but can we do something to help you? You know, if it's something that you remember from a past experience or something you've just always wanted to in some way experience, what can I do? Can we go to the local airport where they have a a, a, a skydiving uh, group and see if maybe they would uh, share with you uh, what they do or how they how they uh, uh, fold their parachutes or can we watch some videos on skydiving or what could we do uh, to bring that sensation to you and, and that little bit of joy to you based on what you want even when I can't always say yes so that's just a good word to think about so where do we go from here I want to share a couple resources with you <clears throat> this one is one that I'm, I'm very proud of. We had someone a number of years ago uh, contact us at Pioneer Network and said, hey, you know, we're looking for some kind of a, a checklist uh, that kind of de defines a little bit about what person-centered language is and we could use to help our teams understand and commit to using more person-centered language. Do you have something? 
And I have to confess, my answer had to be no. Well, within a couple of months, we did. And we worked together with this provider and came up with this commitment to person-centered language. Um, and so it's, it's just a fun tool and it's available on our website. Um, and I'll get, get, get to that in just a minute. But it's available on our, on our website, along with a, another document that goes with it uh, that uh, talks a little bit about uh, how you can use it, some ideas for using that uh, in, in your training. Some other things that are on the Pioneer Network, uh, in the Pioneer Network Resource Library, are the document that I referred to earlier, the article from Karen Shaneman on the language of culture change, that entire article is in there, as well as an article, The Power of Language to Create Culture Change, which was written a number of years ago by uh, uh, three uh, very great advocates uh, in this culture change journey, Carmen Bowman, uh, Judah Ranch, and Galina Majaroff. So I would encourage you to take a look at those. And here's another great resource I am so proud to be able to share with you. Um, and this is from our partners with the Georgia Coalition. And I don't know if we have anybody from Georgia on our call, uh, but Georgia has a wonderful state uh, culture change coalition called the Culture Change Network of Georgia. And through a CMP grant, the Civil Money, Civil Money Penalty grant, um, they have been able to create some phenomenal videos um, that are just short little three minute, about three minute videos on a variety of different topics related to culture change and person centered care. And as you can see here, they have a number of them that are related to language. So I would encourage you to go to their website. Um, Oh, you can go to their Facebook page as well and look at these. They're wonderful little videos that you can share with your team and certainly could help spark a conversation or a discussion. Um, but, and, and, there, and the best news is every resource that I shared with you, whether through Pioneer Network um, or through Culture Change Network of Georgia is free. And I, I think that's one of our favorite price points. So uh, hopefully you will enjoy using them and, and it will be a part of your, um, your resources that you can share with your staff. So we have just a couple minutes. Um, if anyone, open it up if anyone has any questions or comments. This has been, I have to tell you, this has been a great group. You have been so interactive and I love that. Uh, it always makes it more fun. And I think I'll have to, you'll have to tell me if I did. And when I did this at Pioneer Network, I was told the word that I used that I need to be careful of is I kept saying you guys. And I, I don't think I did that. You'll have to tell me if I did, because I think sometimes I do that subconsciously. But I tried real hard to change my language too. Uh, it, it's a work in progress and we're not perfect. And I, well, I'll share one quick thing, you know, have some fun with it. I had a community that, <coughs> that, um, they had a jar, they had a, they had a little jar. And if you said something that was used a term that was not a person centered term, you had to put a quarter in it. And this was a number of years ago, they bought a, uh, a Wii for their, for their residents with everything uh, that they, all the monies that they gained. So we had, did have a question there. Any advice on how to ensure we don't create a person centered culture that's all about what we say versus what we do? Well, I think Benjamin, I think probably the best advice I can give on that is as you explore language and the words you use, make it an, make it an exploration and not a lecture. Um, have people really um, dig deep within themselves as to what the words mean to them, uh, help them uncover the right language to use in their setting. Because I think the piece that's so the piece that I think sometimes we miss as we're, as we're working to build that person-centered culture is we tell a lot of the what, but we don't explore enough of the why. And I really think for culture change to sustain, for person-centeredness to sustain, it has to be based on people knowing and understanding the why behind what they're doing. Because I may be the leader who is helping to guide this, but I'm going to be gone at some point. And if you don't get it, and it's not in your DNA, and you haven't made that personal journey, um, then it's not as likely to stick. So that would be my biggest piece of advice. Uh, oh, there you go. I see enlightened, and there's another term that you said, Benjamin, sometimes I see the enlightened feel better than the unenlightened. There you go, yeah, I hope so. Uh, also important to acknowledge that it might be awkward at first to change words, absolutely. Um, it, this is not easy. If it were, we'd all be doing it. 
And we would have been there a long time ago. And I think that's another great thing to share with your team that guys, this is hard work. And all we can do is a day at a time and help each other out and know we're going to make mistakes, but keep on going. So I'm going to wrap it up because I see the time. I, I, this is a bad habit of mine. I keep on going. I could talk forever. Um, and thank you. Love free, Megan. God bless you. So here's Connect to the Network. If you're not a part of our network, we would invite you. Just go to our website, www.pioneernetwork.net. You can sign up for our newsletter. And we try not to send out too many to, to pile up too high in your, in your uh, uh, emails, but to get you some good information and learn a little bit about what other people are doing. And we would love to have you join us in, in Pittsburgh um, on August uh, 9th through 12th for our annual conference where our good friends from Educate will be joining us. So that said, Pam, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you, Joan. Hopefully, um... There we go. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Joan. That was amazing. You made me uh, think about words again, even though I heard this back in, um, in Louisville. It all, you know, we have to be reminded of it. I think all of us do. It's okay that we slip. Uh, we all do that. I think the important thing is we get back on track. And uh, it's, you know, every day is a new day. And for those of you out there who are championing champions for this cause um, of culture change and changing language, um, I can't say enough about the checklist. I literally, since I received that at the conference uh, last year, I keep it on my desk and I refer to it so often in my written communications and as I'm um, you know, working on things or talking to people. And um, so it, it does help and it's not easy, but we can all do it together. So thank you, Joan. That was uh, amazing as I knew it would be. And I so appreciate you joining us for this first kickoff. Um, so I just want to give, tell you all a little bit about um, February 19th. We're going to be traveling to Minneapolis to meet another innovator and change agent, Lori LeBay from Alzheimer Speaks. And her topic will be dementia care is changing. Are you? Uh, it will be, uh, uh, she will be talking about language too, kind of piggybacking off what Joan has done. Lori has a, a fascinating story of her 30 year journey with her mother who had Alzheimer's disease. Um, she'll talk about her work in creating dementia friendly communities and tapping into the resources that are available in the states and worldwide resources and, and things that we can we can look at that, again, are the best price point free, um, but learn about what we're doing here and around the world. And that's what we really are, are uh, looking to do with this whole um, series that we're presenting to you is just all of us sharing together. Thank you, all of you out there who were wonderful in uh, your interactions with Joan. It uh, was great to see some of the <coughs> And I agree with you, Joan. We learn from each other. We, we learn from others every day. So none of us are really experts, right? Um, so thank you all. And we will see you next month. And uh, thank you again for being a part of this.